that's going that's rising three and running two. So we must first have a dot or a point to start from. And from there I'm going to rise three, one, two, three, and run two. One, two. Now you can see the direction that the line is headed in. You can also run first, which is run two, and then rise three. And you'll still get the next point. Okay? And for linear equations, these slopes are consistent. So if we continue to, to run 2 and rise 3, the line will continue and we'll get additional points. Okay, what to do about negatives on slopes? If those are negative, we typically associate it with the um, numerator. So what we get is a fall 2 run 5. So here, fall 2 from this point and then run 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or you can run 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and fall 2. Now, what to do about slopes that are a single digit, like 2? When you have slopes here, you assume that the run is 1. So we look at 2 and assume we're going to rise 2 and run 1. So for any given point, rise 2, run 1. Or run 1 and rise 2. Now, how do we get slopes? There is a slope formula that we'll memorize. The slope formula says you need two points. You take the y's, the difference of the y's, over the difference of the x's. And this will give you rise over run. So, let's take a couple examples here. Negative 2, negative 1, 1, and 5. And let's see here, we'll have 1, negative 4, and negative 1, negative 1. Now, what we have here are the y's. It says one of the y's, the y2, we're going to keep that. The other y, because it's a negative that's a, that changes the sign, we're going to change that. So we have a keep and change. And for the x's, the, um, one of the x's, or the second x, we're going to keep. But the second x we're going to change. And that's how we'll create a slope. So for the y's of the run, here are the y's right here. I'll keep the 5, but I'll change the negative 1. So we'll keep 5 and change it to a positive 1. On for the x's, we'll do the same thing. I'll keep the 1 here, but I'll change the negative 2 to a positive 2. And that's using the slope formula. And when I simplify, I get 6 over 3, or 2, which will be rising 2 and running 1. Okay, over here, the next one. We want the slope for number 2. What I'm going to do is I'm going for the y's. I'm going to, um, let's keep the negative 4, but change the negative 1. So we'll have negative 4 and a positive 1. And for the x's, same thing, we'll keep the 1 but we'll change the negative one. So keep one and change the negative one to positive one. What we end up with is a negative three all over two. For this one, we would fall three and run two, or run two and fall three. Next, let's talk about special slopes. Before, I gave you the slope first and then I showed you what the line would look like. For the special slopes, I will show you what the line looks like and then we'll develop the slope. 
So for special slopes, there is the horizontal line. And then there's the vertical line. For the horizontal line, going from one point to another point involves no rising. So for horizontal lines, there is no rise. But to get from one point to another point, you will have to run a number of times. So the run could be anything from one above or any number. So zero over any number, or sorry, zero over a non-zero number is zero. What this says is that because horizontal lines only run and never rise, their slopes will always be zero. Now, for a vertical line, the rise to go from one point to another point right here is, well, you're always rising from one point to another, so let's say four times. But for vertical lines, we never run to get from one point to another point, so the run is always zero. Therefore, the denominator will always be zero, and this number will always be undefined. So the slope of a vertical line is always undefined because they never run, they only rise. Now let's look at the point slope formula. The point slope formula is y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. And what it does, it takes a point, which is here, and a slope, which tells you the um, rise and run. takes a point and a slope that gives you the rise and run that creates a line and it tells you the equation of that line that was just created in the form of, we're going to use the form of y equals mx plus b for our linear equations. So let's take a look at this. is two points here. Two points always creates a line. We want the equation of that line. So we're going to use the point slope formula. So if we have our points, now we need a slope. So we're going to do a change and keep. Let's keep and change. So keep one, change negative five to positive five. We're going to keep two and change negative one to positive one. This will give me six over three is 2. Now I have points and slopes. So for my equation y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. We're going to put in the, the, um, the numbers. This is the opposite of y. So it's opposite of that. So I'm going to change that to negative 1. The slope is 2. And for the opposite of x, which is here, I'm going to change that to a negative 2. Okay. Now that I have my point and my slope put in, I'm going to distribute and solve for y. So we'll get 2x minus 4, add 1 to both sides, and my linear equation is described by y equals 2x minus 3. Facts number 2. Same thing. We want a linear equation, so first we want to find the slope. So the slope will be described Let's see, as we will keep the negative 1 and change the negative 4, and here we'll keep the negative 1 and change this to a negative 1. So for the slope for our rise, we're going to keep negative 1, but change this to positive 4. And for the x's, I'm going to keep negative 1 and change that to a negative 1. So I end up with a 3 over a negative 2. And let's call that negative 3 halves. Okay. Now, for my point slope formula, y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. Now, sometimes students wonder which 
point to use. It doesn't matter. As long as you use the X and Y's from the same point, you'll be okay. So, the opposite of Y, let's take this right here, will be positive 1. The slope is negative 3 over 2. And the opposite of X here will be positive 1. So distributing my negative 3 halves, I'm going to get negative 3 halves x minus 3 halves here. Then subtracting 1 from both sides, I end up with y equals negative 3 halves x. Now, I need a common denominator, so I'm going to change this to a negative 2 over 2 together with my negative 3 over 2, which becomes negative 5 over 2. And this is my linear equation. Okay, now that we've established linear functions, let's look at linear models. Linear models use the linear function to describe some aspect. We're going to talk about the cost function as a linear model. The cost function, we'll use the letter C to remember that we're using cost, and the linear model, mx plus b. But because we're using a special cost function, we have to know what's being used for input. For cost function, what we use for input is the um, item. How many items that are made, being made. So, an example of a cost function would be c of x equals 50x plus 200. Now, what this is saying is that Every time we make an item, it's going to cost us $50 plus $200 more dollars. So you make one item, it'll be $50 plus 200. You make three items, it'll be three times 50 plus 200. So this will tell us the cost that it takes to make items. So this is a linear cost function. If I were to graph this, this will be items versus cost items versus cost. Items as an input. Very important. Okay, so when I make no items, this is going to cost me $200. When I make my first item, this is going to cost me now $250. To make two items, this is going to cost me now $300. And you see the cost function rises um, according to how many items that we make. The more items you make, the more it costs to make those items. Now let's talk about the revenue function. The revenue function, we'll describe that with the R. And it's a linear equation. We'll describe it with a linear equation. But for the revenue function, um, the couple of new things. Well, the x or the input for this one is items also. Okay, so this is based on items for input. And the output is money. Okay. Just like the output for the cost was money. Okay. But for the revenue, this is how much money you get when you sell your item. Okay. And because we get no monies to start off with. The B is always zero, so you'll see revenue function without a B because there's no constant that you're given. An example of a revenue function is that if we were to take that same item and sell it for $75. So every time an item is sold, we get $75. One item, $75. Two items, $150. So let's look at a graph of that. So this is items versus revenue. If I sell no items, I have no revenue. If I sell one item, I will have $75. If I sell two items, I will now have $150. So this graph represents the revenue in this case. Now, let's talk about break-even point. Break-even point Ask the question, how, uh, given the cost and given the revenue, how many items must be made and sold in order to break even, to both of them come out, come out even? So we want our cost function, 
when does our cost function equal our revenue function? Or better yet, when does our revenue function finally match up with the cost that it took the, um, to make the item? So, when does R of X equal C of X? Graph-wise, we're graphing the cost function. Let's put the cost function in red. And we're graphing the revenue function we'll put in green. And when those two numbers meet, we're trying to find out the items that it takes for both of those to catch up to each other. So in order to do that, we need to set them equal and solve for the items, or should I say solve for x. So our cost function before was 50x plus 200. Our revenue function before was 75x. We're going to solve for x, or solve for the items that makes both of these equal. So I minus 50x on both sides. And I get 200 equals 25x. We divide both sides by 25. And we get x equals 8 items. So if we were to make and sell 8 items, that will give us a break-even point where our revenue matches how much money we spent in order to produce the items, the break-even point. Next, next function is the profit function. The profit function is made out of um, the cost function and the revenue function. It's how much revenue that you receive minus how much it costs you to make the item. The difference of that is your profit. And if your cost exceeds your revenue, your profit will be negative, or you will see a negative profit. Okay, so let's find out what. Um, let's find our. Um, our profit function. Let's see. So this will be P of X equals um, the um, revenue function is 75X. Now, a frequent mistake that students make when writing down the cost function, because there's a negative sign, right, they neglect to put parentheses around the cost function, which is 50X plus 200. Without this parentheses, you cannot distribute, and therefore you'll get a false um, equation. So the profit function will be 75x minus 50x minus 200, which simplifies to 25x minus 200. The profit function will tell us what our profit will be given the number of items that we make. So let's say we make 10 items. So x is 10 items. Would we make profit from making and selling 10 items? Would we? Let's find out. So profit, I put in 10 items. I get 25 times 10 minus 200. This will give me, for 10 items, 250 minus 200. And P of 10 items will be $50. So yes, I will make a profit of $50 if I make and sell 10 items. Now we're going to look at linear business models that are based on price. Before, the linear models that we did were all based on items. As far as finding the cost and the revenue, um, your input was items. This time, the input will be price. So let's look at the demand function. The demand is how your customers look at buying your things. So I'm going to use the letter D, and this will be a linear model. So it will be MX plus B again. And the items here will be price. Okay. Your customers will look at whether they want to buy your items according to the price. So, an example. Let's say we had a demand function that was negative 2x plus 10. Okay. So, Let's look at this as a graph of, let's see, this is price versus demand. Okay, when your price is zero dollars and you have ten items on your shelf and you open up your doors, 
at the end of the day, you will end up, sorry, um, people would have demanded all 10 of those items because they're free. The price is zero. The next day you open up your door and you decide, I'm going to charge a dollar for the items. People see the price, they say it's cheap, and they buy it, but not all of them. And you notice they only bought eight. Later on, you say, well, I'm going to raise the price to five dollars. And once you raise your price to five dollars, people walk in, they see the price, and they say, that's too much, I don't want to buy it. And at the end of the day, um, your demand is zero. No one has taken any of your items off your shelf. So from the consumer standpoint, as you raise prices, their demand will decrease. If you make the price zero, all your items will leave from your shelf. Now, supply is how the producer looks at things. And let's use S for supply. And this will be a linear equation as well, mx plus b. And let's use the model. Uh, 3x plus 4. So, this is the manufacturer, or the people that make the items. Okay, they open up the factory, and to get started, they'll have a certain number of product typically left over before they get started. And, let's say it's costing them also $3 to make each item. So this is what we're looking at. You input the um, price, that the item will be sold at, and then you'll see how much you can supply. So, if you charge zero dollars, there's still four items in the factory that could be given away. Okay, you just haven't started manufacturing them yet. Then, once you start manufacturing them, let's say you're able to sell them for a dollar. Well, given that you can sell them for a dollar, that gives you more money to pay your um, um, cost of the people that work there and you can pay for the materials and with this you can actually put out four, um, three more items. You can get out seven items. That's if you were to be able to sell it for a dollar. But let's say you were, think about it, let me see, if I were to be able to sell these for two dollars, then I can supply even more because I can hire even more people. I can buy even more materials. I can leave my lights on longer. So at that point, you'll have 10 items that you can make. And so from the manufacturer's standpoint, the higher the price, the more items that they can provide into the market. Now, the equilibrium price says, well, what happens when the consumer wants the price to go down and the supplier wants the price to go up? What should the price be where everyone's happy? The equilibrium price is where the demand function equals the supply function. Or should I say graphically, let's put the demand in red. Demand is here the price is going down. And for the, for the uh, supplier, here the price is going up. Okay, And we're looking for the price for which they agree. So this means that we have to set both equations equal to each other and solve for x, which is solving for price. So, let's take the negative 2x plus 10, set that equal to 3x plus 4, and we're going to solve for x. So here I'm going to add 2x to both sides, and I get 10 equals 5x plus 4. Subtracting 4 from both sides, I get 6 equals 5x, and now I divide both sides by 5, and from there I get 1.2. Now, since this represents a price, I'm going to change this from 1.2 to a dollar twenty. Make it look like a dollar twenty because it represents the price. So, what this means that the price here will be a dollar twenty. It'll be just enough for the consumer to pay for and the manufacturer to make. Now, what would happen if we were to force the situation where we want the um, prices to be lower? We want the consumer here in red um, to pay a lower price. So let's artificially make the price here. It really should be a dollar twenty, but let's make it less. Let's say uh, we don't allow the um, 
the supplier to charge anything more than let's say maybe 80 cents or something. If that happens, the demand for from the consumer goes up high. Now it's higher. It's up to this point. But the problem is with the supplier. He can only supply this many. So what you have is a gap between how many people want and how many can be supplied. And what we have here is a shortage. Now let's go the other way. Let's say that the that supplier charges more than a dollar twenty because he wants more money from this. If he tries to charge more than a dollar twenty for this item, let's say two dollars over here, here's the price. Well, what'll happen for him in the green is that he'll be he'll have this much as far as items. He'll have this many items ready and out there for the people to buy because he spent the money, he made the items. But the people are only buying this many as far as the demand. So there's a gap between here and here. Okay, so instead of there being a sh um, shortage, um, there's an overage. And so there's all these items on the market that people are not buying. This is why this model works so well, because it comes to a point where everybody agrees. If someone charges too much, they'll have a bunch of items unsold. If they charge, if they're made to charge too little, we will have shortages in the market.